familiar with me, you see me with something blows up in the city, so. <laughs> and that's been quite a lot, so that brings us to the age of the infrastructure, what we're dealing with. Uh, let me just make a brief mention, um, once again, of uh, Ron Parks, who has been so diligent in preserving uh, initially glass plates and documents which were uh, slated more or less to be thrown out at the Montebello filtration plant years ago. Um, we've gotten him permission recently to go through more plates that we have stored elsewhere. So he's begun that work. So we're going to have a lot more of these photographs uh, that we uh, have blown up and we will display periodically on the public spaces, most notably around Lake Montebello during National Drink and Water Week, which is in uh, the first week of May. So I'm glad to be here. I haven't taught for ages. Uh, my college teaching days were back in the 70s and early 80s, so uh, bear with me. Let's talk about Baltimore water a little bit, shall we? Let's look at geography first. And um, go to the next slide here, see if this thing works. And as you can see, we are very fortunate. We're right here in the middle of this well-drained location, humid subtropical climate, lots of springs, lots of uh, streams. Uh, we have uh, our location as uh, the westernmost along the fall line of the major port cities. So uh, we boom primarily because of uh, a combination of good climate, plenty of water, and the fact that we were further west than everybody else. Uh, where the fall started. You can't do anything without water. You can't grow, you can't grow crops, you can't produce anything. It's essential. <coughs> it's necessary. Don't want to forget the Native Americans. You've got to talk about them because they were here before we were. Um, anybody's read the book, uh, 1491 came out eight or nine years ago, I guess, talking about you know, what, the, what, the Western, what the Western Hemisphere was essentially like before Columbus came. And so a lot of settlements had, may have already disappeared by the time that John Smith was cruising up the bay in the first decade of the 17th century um, when he came across the Tapsco River. But uh, through disease, through tribal movements, uh, the area was pretty much barren in terms of clearings, that sort of thing. When Smith got here, what he saw was, was forested lands, and uh, and that was basically a beautiful harbor. He did note the Tefco River, he noted the fish, he noted the other wildlife that was located here in a very nice area uh, to settle. Native Americans were primarily the, the Scoutaways who were chased this way um, and further south by the Susquehannocks who were coming in from the north. Um, do you remember the, you know, I'm not very big on historical fiction, but I got to say, I do love Chesapeake. I think it really captures the whole history of the Chesapeake Bay region from the beginnings right on uh, to the Watergate era. Okay, who's next? Sorry, hit the wrong button here. And once again, here's uh, some of the, uh, the quotes from. Uh, from John Smith when he was here, he was noting, by the way, he was saying that, uh, I was like this, um, the fish were lying thick with their heads above the water. As for want of nets, we attempted to catch them with a frying pan, but we meant it to be a bad instrument to catch fish with. <laughs> Neither better fish with more plenty, uh, nor more variety for small fish had any of us ever seen in any place so swimming in the water, but they're not being called frying pans. Baltimore itself, Baltimore Town, was established in 1729. And as with the Native Americans, uh, the English settlers depended upon springs and streams. Um, this was the John Mole painting everybody's seen from 1752. Um, it says that uh, Baltimore at that time, about 25 buildings, including homes for 200 residents, a uh, tavern, of course, a church, brewery, tobacco warehouse, those sorts of things. So that's what, that's what the situation was. And a lot of you probably have seen this. This is the boundaries of uh, 
Baltimore town at the time. This is the plaque that's on the fire department building right at Lexington and, and, and Gay Street. So you can see uh, the Jones Falls over there on the eastern end and uh, very confined basically around the, around the harbor. So <coughs> springs and wells were the primary source of water in addition to um, people who live along some of the streams would get their water directly from there. But basically downtown, you're dealing with uh, various wells that were located at various spots. This is the, the North Fountain here, which is a very social high point uh, place to go. Uh, this was a, approximately Calvert and Saratoga Street. You had other uh, principal wells uh, over on the east side at uh, Pratt and uh, Eden, and then on the west side, uh, Charles and Camden. So these were the major locations where, where people would get their, uh, their water. They were scattered all over the place. You had, and you'll maybe you look at the, at the names of various uh, uh, places throughout the city. You had, uh, Hall Spring up at uh, uh, Herring Run, uh, in the name of Cold Spring, Green Spring, Spring Street, uh, Spring Gardens was on the north shore of the Middle Branch. Uh, Guler Spring Branch, which was, which was the Charles and Lombard. And I even recall when I was a kid uh, up in Northeast Baltimore, uh, where Keith's Field is, you know, where the baseball diamonds are there. Before Moyer Avenue was cut through to uh, Taylor Avenue, we used to play up there. And there was a spring, and we drank from it in the woods right there. So they're very plentiful throughout the, uh, throughout the area. Of course, well, of course, springs aren't going to be enough to keep you going, uh, especially if the population was growing as quickly as it was. If you look here on the left, these are the rankings of 5324 of Baltimore City in terms of national population where we stood. So you're back here at the first U.S. Census of 1790, and we're down there in the 20,000 or less range. And uh, by the time you get to the War of 1812, which is the third bar over there, the two third, fourth bars, uh, you see we're up to 50,000 people. So it quickly became apparent that something had to be done uh, to address the uh, growing population. And by the way, when we dropped and ranked up there, it wasn't because of the Western growth, it was basically because of the Eastern growth, because that's when you had uh, the influx of immigrants into uh, New York. So it, um, at that time, it was New York, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, and Baltimore. Population. So early on in the town, and as the town reached uh, incorporation in 1797, it got to a point where uh, fire was the number one concern in terms of water. So people had to be uh, had to keep leather buckets. There was a law that was passed in 1787 that every household had to have two leather buckets to fight fires. Not the most efficient way in the world of doing it, but uh, that was at the time. Even in, even during that period, the 1780s before incorporation, and then immediately after incorporation in the late 1790s, there was a push to create a water company. They tried, they failed, they tried, they failed. Uh, it was, uh, I think, three times before they finally got it really rolling in 1804. And it was largely due to the uh, the bright lights of the community that, that did this, and also some people who had uh, connections uh, elsewhere. Charles Carroll Carrollton was a leading figure. Um, John Eager Howard, Samuel Smith, who's not up there, Robert Goodloe Harper, um, Robert Mills, the uh, famous uh, more or less everything, including architect of two Washington Highlands. Uh, they were all involved in the creation of the Baltimore Water Company, which uh, or the ultimate formation of all the water company in 1804. So, if they're going to bring water into Ascension, what was the city at the time, wrapped around the harbor, north of the harbor primarily, uh, they were looking at three locations. They were looking at the Gwynn's Falls, which seemed to be an early favorite, uh, the Jones Falls, and Herring Run. The benefit, of course, uh, going further up, going to Herring Run, was the further away you got from people, the higher elevation you were, the better quality of water. So you had to look at the quality of water, uh, the cost of bringing it in, 
the uh, seasonal flow of the water, uh, and they ultimately decided that Jones Falls is going to be the, the best route to go. It's closed near where we need to be, so, um, and the uh, getting access to it was uh, fairly easy. Let's see. In addition, at this time, we had a major fire in Baltimore, uh, one of many in 1804, which also helped to spur all this one. By 1807, they developed uh, waterworks that were located at the southeast corner of Calvert and Center Street. Sometimes I wish they put those back there. But uh, if you know what I'm talking about, it's where the Baltimore Sun is located. <laughs> so, uh, so you had, you had a, a, a reservoir and waterworks. I, I was driving up Calvert Street the other day, had to deal with another emergency, uh, something else. Um, and uh, I was looking at my rear view mirror and I was looking at the slope of Calvert Street. And I thought, yeah, at this time, this would probably be pretty good. It does go, you know, it does go down. And you, when you're downtown further, you know, you're looking up a lot at, at Calvert Street and then it goes, it has a little dip, but ultimately it's a, it's a nice slope, it's a good location. Um, as time went on, of course, other reservoirs were built at, at higher levels, but essentially that's where the Jones Falls flowed. You know, can't really see it there anymore, but that's where that's 